Already? There are uh, sheets down here if you want your note-taking sheets. I also have some from last week uh, as well. So you don't want to forget what we did last week, and, and you want to keep working on that, uh, what we did last week as well, too. But the sheet that you'll need for tonight will say Session 2, My Story on it. My story. All right, let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. And I pray that your grace and mercy would be on us as we seek your will for our lives, as we study your word tonight. I pray blessings on each and every person here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm gonna go, we're going to start off with a little exercise, and I don't, I don't want you to answer too quickly, but just think about this just for a moment. Some of this it won't apply to because some of you are not 18 yet, but most of the room it will apply to us. All right. If you're under 18, what would you go back and tell your 12-year-old self? All right, but for the rest of us in here, what would you go back, what advice would you go back and give to your 18-year-old self? If, if you could travel back in time and visit, if Miss Becky Bush could visit 18-year-old Becky Bush, <laughs> what piece of advice would she give herself? So I'm going to give you just a, a minute to think about it, and then we'll, we'll have some volunteers say what they would say. <laughs> what you need? If Michael could go back in time to his 18 year old self, he would say, You're never going to use anything you learned in literature class. <laughs> I'm just teasing. What would you, say, what would you tell yourself? Take college grades seriously. You didn't? I always tried my best in every subject. I never skipped college class to go fishing. All right, what else would you tell yourself? Take college seriously. Be kinder to your parents. What else? Right. I would tell my 18-year-old self, you're not really fat now. That's what I would tell my 18-year-old self. <laughs> Just wait. What else? Opinions of others don't matter that much. Anybody else? Old people know what they're talking about. Old people know what they're talking about. All right. Now, let's, let's flip the, the script forward, okay? If your 100-year-old self could travel back in time to this day, all right, and have a conversation with you, what do you think your older 100-year-old self would tell you now? <laughs> Yeah, you're going to make it, all right? <laughs> Retire early. <laughs> what, what would your 100-year-old self tell you now? <laughs> Take better care of yourself. Pursue, yeah, pursue faith. That's good. Right? I like it. Spend time with your people. What else? Right. 
Bradley's talking like a politician over here. He just said a while ago, uh, what people say don't matter, and now he's saying, no, oh, relationships matter. I don't know what's going on. What did he say? He said relationships matter. I'm just picking on Bradley because I, I can. All right, what else? So one of the things that I think it's important for us to think about as we get started with tonight is everybody has life experiences, right? We all have different experiences in life. Some of them are good. Some of them are great. Most of them are very forgettable. And if you're like me, we forget them pretty quickly. And some of them are terrible, okay? Some of them are, are, are Bad as in it's a small inconvenience in my life and other things are so bad they're life altering, they're life changing. So we all have these experiences in life, but the problem is, is nobody interprets those experiences. Does that make sense? So if, if you could go back now and, and tell your 18 year old self, you know what, what other people say about you really doesn't matter that much. That's interpreting life. Does that make sense? You, you've, you've gone through an experience, and now that you've gone through that experience, you're able to look back on it and go, hey, if I were you, this is the important thing here. Okay? That's interpreting life. But the problem is, is a lot of times nobody does it. Everybody has life experiences. Everybody has experiences in their if we stick with our story metaphor from last week, everybody has experiences in their story, but not everybody really interprets it, okay? So, uh, so last week, we, we talked largely about Ephesians 2.10, okay? That God has, once we are saved, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9, if you remember that from last week, we're saved by grace through faith, we get to Ephesians 2.10, okay? Okay? We are God's workmanship, his poema, his, his masterpiece that he's working on. And he has stuff planned for us to do in advance. Okay? That's important to remember because we're going to take another stepping stone today. So last week we kind of talked about the fact that God has a mission for us. Okay? I don't like to think of God as a dreamer. Uh, dreams are like stuff that may or may not happen, right? But I think God is a planner, right? So God has a mission for you, right? That he has prepared before you were saved, he has a mission for you, right? That he has prepared in advance for you, okay? Now, we talked about that last week. We're going to begin to put some feet on that, okay? So God gives each and every one of us what I would call a general calling. And those are the big things that we see in Scripture. Love others. Serve others. Share your faith, right? But in that bigger calling, God gives each and every one of us, I think, what we would call like specific or special callings where he says, hey, Michael, I've made you this way so that you can share the gospel with these people over here. Okay? Hey, uh, I've given you this story over here so that you can minister, serve, and, and share the gospel with this type of people over here, right? So, and, uh, and God does each and every one of us this way. That way, God has multiple arrows, and we're going to get into this here in just a second, that he can shoot out into the world and hit different types of targets. Because God's target doesn't always look just like me or us. It looks like a whole lot of different people. Right? And God has built us this way. All right? So, knowing and naming your special calling can really change your life. But to do that, you can't just have a story with experiences in it. You've got to have a story with experiences in it, and then you need to interpret those experiences. Does that make sense? Clear as mud? Everybody following me so far? All right. Last week, we, we, we talked about our big five things that we're going to talk about for the rest of these weeks together, which is my story, my gifting, my passion, my calling, and my goal, okay? So if you'll flip over on page 14, uh, you've got this neat little diagram of an arrow hitting a target. 
So we're going to fill in these blanks, and this is just meant for you to kind of get a picture of what it looks like to discover what God wants you to do and, and everything God's doing in your life, how He's shaped you, how He's building you, how He's speaking to you, so that you can accomplish Ephesians 2.10 in your life. All right? So let's start with the arrow shaft, okay? So the arrow shaft, that is your story. All right, so the arrow shaft is primary. We got any bow hunters in here besides me and Clay? All right, all right. So the 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 arrow shaft is is the the piece of the arrow that is the longer part in the middle, right? And it holds everything together. All right, and it it's what enables when I when I pull an arrow back, okay, and I have it knocked in my bow, all right. That, that shaft is going to determine how much force that arrow has when it hits its target, okay? But it's, stru it's a structural part of the arrow, right, to which the other components are attached, and that is your story, okay? So what I'm saying here is God's using your life, and he's attaching all these things to it so that you can function in his kingdom, Okay? You're not a spiritual island. But God is letting things happen in your life. He's putting things into your life to mold you and make you into who He wants you to be. All right, so that you can accomplish kingdom work. All right. The second thing is the knock. Does everybody know what the arrow knock is? Do I need to go into a lesson here? That's the little piece that goes into the string. Okay. So the arrow knock, okay, is what makes the thing fly. So when I put that knock into my string, I'm now able to, to direct my energy from pulling the bow back straight into the shaft. Okay, that's what's making my arrow fly. All right? So the knock's the tip that connects the arrow to what makes it fly. That's your gifting. Okay? And as, we, as you think about the first time I read this, I was like, that is the strangest little illustration. But the more I looked at it, I was like, it really makes a lot of sense. All right? So the arrow shaft is your story. That's where God connects everything to you. The knock is the gifting. All right? So what is God doing in your life? How has he built you? How has he gifted you so that you can make an impact in God's kingdom? All right? Number three is the arrow fletching. All right, that's your feathers, right? That's what makes your arrow fly straight, right? If you've ever fletched an arrow yourself and you messed up your fletching, okay, it's usually at a close distance not that bad, but if you get out further, it's bad, okay? Because those fletches make your arrow spin, and that's why it's able to stay on target. But if you got some of those on wrong where your arrow's not spinning correctly, it's not going to fly, all right? Your arrow fletching, that's your passion, okay? That's what makes you get up in the morning and do what you do. That's what keeps your life focused in a singular direction is your passion, okay? Number four <coughs> is the arrow head. This is the the point, okay? And that's really the functional part of the arrow, right? The arrowhead enables the arrow to accomplish its purpose, right? That's your calling. So if I'm in my deer stand, this never happens to me because, well, I don't bow hunt a lot anymore because it's 107 degrees in, in Alabama during bow season, but so if I'm in my deer stand, all right, and uh, I pull my arrow back, I've got it knocked, right? So I've got my gifting, I've got all this stuff attached to the, the shaft of the arrow, that's my story. But when I release that arrow, if I'm aiming at a deer, I've got one purpose in mind, and that is back straps on the grill, right? Now. There are all different kinds of arrowheads, and if I'm shooting rabbits, I don't use the same type of arrowhead. If I'm trying to shoot a turkey, I don't use the same type of arrowhead. 
If I'm shooting a deer, there are certain types of arrowheads that I use to make that arrow accomplish its purpose, all right? Which, when I release it from my bow, is certain death and destruction, okay? But the arrowhead is your calling, okay? That's what enables you to accomplish your purpose, right? And lastly, number five is the target. And that's your goal. That's your goal. So when I pull my arrow back and I'm looking through my little peep sight and I've got everything lined up, I've got my form correctly, okay, my goal is when I release my arrow for it to hit exactly where I'm pointing it. I don't want it to hit four inches to the right. I don't want it to hit six inches low. I want that arrow to go exactly where I'm pointing it, right? That's my goal, okay? And as believers, I think it's important for us to have a goal, all right? And a lot of times, we'll talk about this more later on, but a lot of times I don't think we ever have spiritual goals in our life, especially when it comes to what we're going to do in God's kingdom, all right? So, if you would, take your Bibles and open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to talk about that just a little bit. 1 Samuel 17, it's the story of David and Goliath. Most of you probably already know it. And as I prepared this and looked over this, all I could hear in my brain was Matt Chandler going, you're not David, okay? But we're going, we're going to learn something from David tonight that I think stays true to the text, okay? So here's your big thought. Under your arrow shaft there, you've got a thing that says big thought, and this is what I want you to think about. I've already said it two or three times, but I want you to write it down, all right? Most people have experienced their story. That means you're, you're living life, you're going to Disney World, you're, uh, your uh, kids graduate, you graduate college, you graduate high school. We have all these different experiences in our life. So we've experienced their story, but few have interpreted their story, right? interpreted their story. Meaning, we don't reflect in it in a way to what God is doing in our life to, to, to say, now that this has happened in my life, how can I use this for God's glory? Right? We're not interpreting our story. Even fewer can articulate their story that helps them find their place in God's story. And that is the breakdown, is it not? We divorce everyday life from what happens on Sunday. Okay? And we divorce everything I do during the day from my Bible time that I had earlier that morning. It's like two different worlds for us. But when you look at the Great Commission, one of the things that God's very intentional about is the phrasing of that when Jesus says, as you go. Meaning like, as you experience your life, you teach, you share the gospel, you baptize, right? It's God's wanting to blend what he's doing in the world with what he's doing in your life right now. What he's done in your life in the past, okay? And that is the breakdown. And that is where we kind of spend all our spiritual wheels going, what is it that God wants me to do? It's because we experienced things in our lives and we haven't thought through them in a spiritual manner so that we can say, I know, why, I know, I, I know how I can use this experience for God's glory now. That's the breakdown. Okay? So let's look at 1 Samuel uh, Chapter 17, verses 1 through 37. And I'm going to read this to you just real quick just because I think it's an awesome story. And I'm, I'll try not to preach a, a huge long sermon here. I have, no, I have no idea what time it is, by the way. Could be dangerous, maybe good. Okay. 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sokoa, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokoa and Azekah, 
in Ephes Damon. All right? Now, Hebrew language is uh, just beautiful, isn't it? And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there they came out from the camp of the Philistines, a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Big dude. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's boom beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. In other words, this dude is, he's number one, he's big, right? And he is the Navy SEAL of his day, right? If there's a piece of armor, he's got the best. And he's got a shield bearer there to help him, okay? So verse 8, so he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So what they're proposing here was something that was actually very common back in those days. And it was a, a form of what they called representative battle. Okay, uh, If you've ever seen the movie Troy with Brad Pitt, he is their champion. Okay, And this is really a great way to fight with your enemies, but then make sure you could go tend your field on Monday, okay, uh, is really how this was set up. So both cultures and both sides would say, hey, there's no need in us losing 5,000 people out here today. We're trying to feed our families just like you're trying to feed your families. So we'll put our best guy out here, you put your best guy out here, and whoever wins, that'll be the win. That'll be the winner, all right? Verse 10, and the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of Epaphrodite of Bethlehem and Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle. The names of his three sons who went into battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shem. Shema, no, Shemamama. Anybody else want to take a, a shot at that? All right. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took a stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand and see if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. So daddy's worried. He wants a, a, a report. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. They're not really fighting. They're just standing. All right. And David arose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment of the host that was going to the battle line shouting the war cry. So every morning Israel gets up like and they run to the top of the hill and they just stand there for the rest of the day. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against army and David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And as he talked to them behold the champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before and David heard. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. So everybody takes a step back, right? And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Notice in verse 25, just pause and notice their focus. Everything's like material, Right? Have you seen the size of this dude? Uh, hey, it, you know if you kill him, I mean, that's, that's winning the lottery, okay? You get a princess and all this money and all this stuff. 
And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David looks at it through a spiritual lens. Everybody else is saying, Hey, have you seen how big this guy is? And man, you're going to get rich. All right? David's interpreted this thing from a, a, a spiritual standpoint. Who does this little pagan guy think he is to come over here and insult the one true God? All right? And the people answered him in the same way. So it shall be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to these men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Shouldn't you be at home making your bed? All right. I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. You just want to watch us get killed down here today. That's all you're here for. And then I love the exchange here because you can tell they are like legit brothers. And David, the little brother, goes, what, what have I done now? All right? Was it not but a word? Okay. Can I not even have a conversation without you jumping on my case? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him as before. So David's making his way through the crowd. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul. And he sent for him. So this gets out. Hey, this young guy's talking about why in the world is, are we letting Goliath uh, come out here and taunt Yahweh God like this? Okay. So that gets to Saul, and Saul sins for it. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're but a youth. Okay? You, you have zero war experience. Okay? And you're a young dude. You ain't even got no muscles yet. All right? And he's been a man of war from his youth. But notice, this is where I want you to really key in. But notice what David says, starting in verse 34. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, struck him, and killed him. Verse 36. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. We'll stop in verse 37. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. <coughs> and Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Now, you can put your finger in right there if you want or whatever. Now I want you to flip over to Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. And I want you to see something about what David is doing in his life that each and every one of us need to do in our life. Matthew gives a genealogy of Jesus, and he talks about all these people, how uh, uh, Jesus is connected to King David and all that kind of stuff. Because in Matthew... He's trying to promote Jesus as king, right? But in Matthew chapter 1, I want us to start in verse 5. And I want you to just notice two ladies in here. Verse 5. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David the king. So Matthew mentions two things in David's genealogy. One of them is the story of Rahab, right? Did you catch it? Boaz by Rahab, right? So in the story of, of Rahab, what happens in that story? Who can, who, can, who, can, who can give us a Cliff's Notes? Spies go in to, to look at the land, all right? And uh, she hides them, okay? And basically changes her allegiance to go, hey, I'm, I'm not with these folks. I'm, I'm with the one true God. So they work out a system. When they uh, uh, attack the city, or attack the city, they three-piece band the city, I guess. I don't know, with their trumpets and yelling. Okay, uh, Rahab puts a little uh, 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 towel outside of her window so they know that's her. All right. So when the city falls, 
she is delivered through that process, right? So tell me about Ruth and Boaz. Ruth, Ruth uh, yeah, so Ruth is married. Husband dies. You know, everybody dies. There's a famine in the land. Okay, she ends up moving back to Israel with her mother-in-law. You remember the story, okay? They concoct a plan, and through God's deliverance and sovereignty, God sends Ruth, a kinsman redeemer, in the form of Boaz, right? So we see this story of deliverance in Rahab, and then we see the story of deliverance with Ruth and Boaz as well, right? So... What I think David is doing in 1 Samuel, and he's going, you know what? God has always delivered my family. Okay? Maybe he's thinking in the back of his mind. You know, I remember great Aunt Ruth. All right? I remember uh, great-great-grandma Rahab. You know, didn't choose the best occupation in the world, but it worked out. Okay? And then he, he takes his life story and he interprets it in front of Saul. And he says, you know what, you know what King Saul? In the past when I was doing this for, for my dad and a lion attacked and a bear attacked, I did these things. And you know who delivered me? God. Right? And you know, you know who's going to deliver me when I fight Goliath? God. God is a deliverer. If there's one thing I've learned in my life, it's that God's a deliverer. But what I want you to see in the story is David isn't just living out a life experience. He is interpreting it in a way where he is finding the spiritual truths and what God is doing in his life. Now, you may have had an experience in your life where you fought a bear and killed it too. All right? But that's just the story. But what we have to do as Christ followers is interpret that in light of God's kingdom and our purpose on earth. Does that make sense? All right. So let's begin to do that. Okay. We're not, we're not going to discuss these table questions, but I want you to think about maybe number three. What, what, it may be a hidden thing, it might not be a hidden thing, but what things might lie dormant in your past that if left uninterpreted might keep you from seeing what God has in store for you? I want you to think about that. Okay, What has God done in my past that has shaped me that if I leave these things out, I may, I may for lack of a better term, I believe God's more sovereign than this, I may miss the boat, I may miss the target. Okay, just think about that. Okay, now, everybody got something to write with. Okay, there are moments in your life that they call, what they call hinge moments. Okay, and these are, these are big events in your life that kind of shape who you are. It may be a good event, it may be a bad event, right? So, evidently, Corey loves uh, Kelly. The first thing of his high point was his first date with Kelly. Didn't say if they got married, but maybe, I mean, that must have been a great first date that he put that down as number one, right? His, you know, so he lists 10 great things that has happened to him. Going on a date with Kelly was number one, and he lists 10 hard times. Evidently, Suzanne's birthday party didn't work out very well for him, all right? Number seven, okay? There's a, another list of, uh, that Emma has here. Her top 10 high points, family days. Top 10 hard times, moving from Greenville. That's page 16 and 17. Now, you have them too, okay? And I don't know if you can do this. I'm going to give you about four minutes, okay, to just kind of write some of these down. So if you could give me six of the best things that have happened to you that have shaped your life and maybe six of the worst, <coughs> Okay? and kind of put those down. Some of these, you don't have to share all these. I know some of these might be personal, so I'm not going to ask you to share those, but I want you to begin to think about those. I 
I do say this from the story of David. It, it really is from like recognizing what God has done in our past that we're kind of able to join, to have the courage to join him in what he's doing in the future. That's why it's important that we recognize that God is doing things and has done things in our lives. That's why you're doing this exercise now. I think a lot of times we, don't, we miss the fact that God's doing things in your life. have to be a perfect list. We'll kind of work on this as we go. All right? Just about a, another minute or so. Anybody want to share one? One of the one of the big ones for me is uh, me not graduating college on time. I had I had miscalculated my classes and I had one class in at Graceville that I had to have to graduate. I had one credit that I was shy, but that's the credit. That's the semester me and Allison started dating. So that was a that was a biggie for me. Very hard, very sacrificial. Anybody else? If they're super personal, I don't want you to feel like you got to bear your soul here and let's all weep. But, but just think about those. Continue to work on those things. All right. The next thing I want you to do is remember what we did last week where it was, uh, it said, you know, basically your name exists to honor God and help others by blanking blank. You remember that from last week? All right, we're going to work on this more as we go, and we'll refine this as we go. But I want you to ch kind of begin to, to flirt with and think through how, how does that statement that I exist to honor God and help others by, by, by doing whatever, and then these events that you're thinking about, how do those things merge together? How do they come together? All right. And then your last fill in the blank here on page 22, I'm going to give that to you for, I know some of y'all just have to have all the blanks filled in. And I'm going to tell you a story and we'll be done. An uninterpreted past determines your future. An interpreted past fuels your future. You see the difference? If I'm just living life and I, I don't ever put God in my thought process of, of how he is shaping me through the things that are happening in my life, then my, my future is largely set. I'm never going to be really engaged in anything kingdom worthy. 
But if I'm thinking through my life, through my spiritual goggles, through my Jesus goggles, then everything God is doing and has done in, in my past should be propelling me to go, that's where I, I can help these people. I can minister to these people. All right? But uh, uh, and we miss those things all the time. We fail to interpret our past. So uh, if, I don't know if you guys remember when we moved here, Blakely was young. Blakely would, would not walk on her feet. I don't know if y'all remember this. She would not walk on her feet. She would walk on her knees. She would jump on her knees, run on her knees, spin around on her knees, but she would not stand on her feet when she was little. And uh, so this bothered, of course, me and Allison and things like that. So we put her in some uh, classes to help her walk and, and things like that. And Blakely started walking. Everything was fine. And uh, I didn't really think much about it, you know. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, I'd, I'd forgotten what a huge deal it was to us at the time. And several years later, later uh, Blakely had to be 10 or 12 at this point, uh, Susanna came back for a Tables of Love, Susanna Bowie. And I'm, we're just talking and laughing in the gym over there. She's asking me about the kids, and I'm like, oh, Mackenzie's in, I don't know, whatever, 10th grade, you know, Blakely's... Uh, 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 dancing now and all that and her dance teacher her hip hop teacher had just put a video of him and her dancing on Instagram and it was like what does it take for a video to be viral it was viral in my heart okay <laughs> thousands and thousands of views on this of Blakely doing her little hip hop dance so I just pull it up all excited I show Susanna I was like, check this girl out, you know, so, and I'm making jokes about, well, she had to get it from her mama because she didn't get it from me, you know, that kind of stuff. And Susanna watches that video, and she just looks at me, and she goes, and just think, all this from a girl who wouldn't walk. And it was like, in that moment, God hit me with a sledgehammer, and he said, you missed it. You missed it. Right? And I think God does stuff like that in our lives all the time, where he is delivering us. And he is providing for us. And he's guiding us. And he's showing himself to be big in our lives. And we miss it. We forget to give him the credit for it. And because we do that, we are unable to be shaped in such a fashion where we could be, our, our use in the kingdom of God can be maximized. Right? And it happens to each and every one of us. Right? So tonight, your story. All right? God is purposely putting things in your life to build you in such a way that you can minister in his kingdom. And you know what? Your story is different from my story. That's why God calling you to do specific things may or may not be the same things God's calling me to do. And the, 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 the people that he is sending you to may be different from the people that he is sending me to. But your, your homework this week is two things, right? Number one, think about these events in your life, okay? What are, the, what are the big things that have kind of shaped me to where I am now, okay? What did God do in those, okay? And because of those things, how can I be used in, in his kingdom, all right? And continue to go back to week one, all right? So I'm here to honor God and help others by doing what, Okay? Think about those things some more this week. That's, that's your homework, all right? All right. I love you guys. Next week, we'll talk about, uh, we'll add another knock to our arrow. We're talking about gifting next week, okay? So hang on to that arrow illustration. You may kind of want to put that in your memory banks a little bit. We'll be coming back to that a lot, okay, as we, we continue to work through this. Let me pray for us, and uh, we'll, we'll ease out of here. Father, I thank you so much for tonight. I thank you so much for each and every person in this room. And God, I pray that tonight you would help us understand and help us see with our spiritual eyes your faithfulness in our lives through each and every circumstance that we have ever walked through and each and every circumstance that we will walk through. 
And God, I pray that you would help us see how you have shaped us so that we could be useful in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.